If the only way to save your daughter from a slow and painful death was to murder a complete stranger in the next seven hours, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the blood contract in Rattlesnake. Katrina would do anything to save her little girl, and that means someone in this dusty town of Tulia, Texas, is about to have a bad day. But as she's about to find out, taking a life without forfeiting your own is a lot harder than one might expect. Let's see if she has what it takes to pull the trigger. Katrina Katrina and her five-year-old daughter, Clara, are on a near thousand-mile road trip to visit Katrina's mother when a traffic jam prompts a last-minute detour across bumfuck nowhere, Texas. Still a good five hours from their destination, Katrina's Subaru blows a tire, bringing them to a dead stop on a deserted stretch of sun-scorched highway. Without the cell service to summon AAA, Katrina takes matters into her own hands, working harder, not smarter, against the stubborn lug nuts while young Clara pokes around the sagebrush off the side of the road. Suddenly, the carefree child treads too close to a hidden rattlesnake. Without warning, the concealed serpent chooses violence and strikes the young girl below the knee. Hearing her daughter's cries, Katrina immediately comes to her aid, but unable to call for help, she scoops up the now unresponsive Clara and rushes her to a nearby drug lab. The screen door of the rundown trailer is unlocked, which Katrina takes as an invitation to barge right in. Fortunately for the both of them, the mysterious homeowner just finished whipping up a batch in time to lend a helping hand. The strange woman claims to have treated her share of snake bites and offers to help the young girl while Katrina addresses the flat tire. But before Katrina can spring into action, the Good Samaritan cryptically informs her that payment will be discussed later. Channeling her inner F1 team, Katrina quickly swaps in the spare tire and hauls ass back to the trailer to pick up Clara. She finds her daughter resting comfortably in the bedroom, but strangely enough, the wound on her leg appears to have vanished completely, along with any trace of of the odd woman that helped them. Not wanting to waste any time in seeking proper medical attention, the two return to the vehicle and head for the nearby town of Tulia. For the moment, things are looking up, but a little snake venom is about to be the least of their concerns. And losing your sanity trying to get a revenge kill on your 14-year-old nemesis in Call of Duty whose MLG Pro drop shot at you for the seventh time in a row is about to be the least of your concerns. Take the L, Alt F4 your FPS, hop on the couch, and download Dragon City for free on your device. Get that dopamine hit the 12-year-old kids are depriving you of by casually building your own dragon empire. Draft your dragons, collect food so they don't starve, let them amass gold for you, then use the gold to buy dragon eggs. Hatch them, feed them, evolve them into mature adult dragons. Then usher both of your dragons to the breeding cave, and if all things go well, you'll end up with a dragon baby. Then you can send your dragons to a training camp, teach them attack moves, and send them into the arena to fight for your glory. If that goes well, your baby dragon won't be orphaned, and they will become more powerful. If you show enough talent, other dragon masters will accept you as a member of their alliance. You can join the battle pass in the weekly mini games every week, where you can claim daily prizes and dragons. You can even obtain a Mr. Nerd Dragon. Just kidding, he'd be far too OP. But you can get some of the most famous YouTubers' dragons. Download Dragon City by clicking the link in the description, or scanning the QR code to get a special free starter pack of 15,000 food, 30,000 gold, and the Flame Knight Dragon. Either Katrina's losing it, or her daughter was just saved by a witch doctor. What do you bet this payment she mentioned isn't the kind you settle with Matt? MasterCard. Regardless, all of this could have been avoided had she followed the basic principles of driver safety and kept Clara in the vehicle while swapping out the tire. Letting her roam unsupervised like this only creates an opportunity for her to walk blindly in front of another car. Besides, the desert is home to more than just rattlesnakes. A child her size is easily small enough to be targeted by coyotes, and there's bound to be all kinds of venomous spiders and scorpions around just waiting for her to stick her hands somewhere she shouldn't. Once we know that she's been bitten by a snake, we should try to snap a quick photo of the snake with our phone before it slithers away. A decent picture should be all it takes to help the hospital administer the correct anti-venom. Statistically speaking, it was probably a dry bite, but we should still treat this as a worst case scenario until we know for sure. Ideally, we'll want to hold the bite location below her heart and do our best to keep her calm. This will help slow the rate at which the venom circulates through her bloodstream. Using ice or applying a tourniquet might sound like good ideas, but this will actually work 
work to exacerbate the tissue damage, and could even result in amputation of the affected limb. We also want to avoid cleaning the wound as any venom left on our skin could potentially be used by the medical staff to identify the proper anti-venom. The quintessential cowboy trick of sucking out the venom is an absolute no-go. At best, it's a complete waste of time, and at worst, we wind up envenomating ourselves through a small cut in our mouth or throat. The good news is that it typically takes two to three days for rattlesnake venom to shut down bodily function, so even if we halved this to account for her age, we'd still have plenty of time to get her proper medical treatment. The fact that she's unconscious is cause for alarm, but this is more likely due to the intense pain she's experiencing than actual effects of the venom. Instead of hauling her off to the nearest crack shack on foot a quarter mile away through a minefield of more rattlesnakes, I would take her back to the Subaru and buckle her in the back seat. Even though our phone shows no coverage, it'd still be worth trying 911, as calls to emergency services aren't limited to the cell towers in our network. If that doesn't work, I would focus on changing the tire and then head back the way we came until we had enough service to call an ambulance. Even if we don't feel like sticking around to make the repair, we could easily just take it slow and limp our way back on the flat. There's honestly no reason for us to go nosing around in someone's beat up old homestead. This is Texas. Texas. You really don't want to be caught trespassing here. Besides, no one parks their trailer out in the middle of nowhere because they want company. We could very well be walking in on a late series Walter White here, and we all know how that could turn out. But since we just had to go soliciting the milk of human kindness, we should at least try harder to make our presence known before barging in. Nothing inside this place screams, I own the world's largest supply of anti-venom. So just about the only thing that we should be asking her for is the use of her phone, or possibly even some help changing the tire. I don't care what kind of experience she claims to have. I'd want to know exactly what she plans on doing to treat the bite. And even then, there's no way I'm leaving my daughter alone with this weirdo. And as a general rule of thumb, you discuss payment before treatment, not after. That's how you get screwed, especially when dealing with a crack shack. At the hospital, a doctor attributes Claire's condition to nothing more than exhaustion and mild dehydration, citing a lack of any evidence that she was ever bitten in the first place. But all the same, he wants to keep her for a day to monitor her recovery. Katrina won't have it, insisting her daughter had stopped breathing entirely at one point. Concerned she might be delirious from the long drive, the doctor examines Katrina as well, prescribing them both some rest before leaving the room. Some time later, a sharp-dressed gentleman pays the two of them a visit. Turns out he's here on behalf of the trailer park hero to collect for Clara's treatment, and unfortunately, Blue Cross doesn't cover blood magic. The man explains that the only way to cover the cost of saving her daughter's life is by preemptively taking the life of somebody who is about to commit murder. Minority report style. Yes, I'm obligated by YouTube's community guidelines to inform you that these targets aren't innocent at all. How does Katrina know who's about to commit a murder? The healer bestowed her with a sixth sense, if you will. She literally sees evil people. Problem is, nobody else knows what these psychos are planning, and if we get caught, we'll be spending life in prison. The target can be anyone she chooses, but it must be a human being, and she only has until sunset, giving her roughly seven hours to do the deed. Otherwise, her little girl's soul will be repossessed by the bank of the undead, and her condition will return to what it was before being treated by the mysterious stranger. Naturally, Katrina tells him to fuck right off before she calls security, to which he responds by giving her a taste of what is to come, should she fail to pay the debt on time. Suddenly, Claire's skin turns gray, and the bite marks reappear on her leg. In a panic, Katrina screams at the man to get out and sounds the alarm, but by the time the two members of the medical staff arrive on the scene, Claire is symptom have completely disappeared again. What kind of racket are these people running? Claire was bitten by a rattlesnake. It's not like they had to sew her freaking head back on. This is why you ask questions before you let some high plane skeleton witch slink off with your unconscious five-year-old. Had we known ahead of time, payment was code for straight up murder somebody. There's no way in hell we would have left our child alone with that lunatic. Not with an easily treatable snake bite. The fact that this suit is somehow aware of what went down out in the desert strongly suggests that what he's saying is legit. 
bit, as well as our hallucinations. Now is not the time to go shooting the messenger. We need to pump him for as much information as he's willing to give us. I'd want to know what the cause of Claire's death would be if I refused to go through with it. If it's just supposed to be the rattlesnake venom, well, we're already at the hospital, so it probably wouldn't be worth risking life imprisonment or death when a quick dose of anti-venom would probably do the trick. If it turns out that she was bitten by some kind of magical demon snake, and only through the healer's intervention could she have ever possibly survived, well, then I guess it's game on. In that case, we should also ask him to specify the exact time at which the deal expires, to gain a better sense of just how long we have to plan and execute the perfect crime, to stop the pre-crime. This is not unlike the situation from Game of Death, in that the ideal target would be someone who's already on the verge of checking out. The unconscious old man across the hall seems like the perfect candidate. You know, because he's secretly plotting to kill people and stuff. As for how we ultimately carry out the heinous act, we'll want to make it look like natural causes, so smothering or some kind of fast-acting poison will probably be our best bet. Fortunately, people are on their way out, usually have plenty of pillows nearby to make their passing more comfortable. Realizing no one in the right mind would ever believe her, Katrina returns to the spot on the highway where Clara was bitten. The discarded tire confirms she's in the right place, but the run-down old trailer is nowhere to be found. Desperate for answers, Katrina sets out into the sagebrush in search of any sign of the mysterious healer. Just then, a passing tanker truck pulls up behind her car. Katrina tries to wave him off before she's forced to explain her bizarre behavior, but the trucker's intentions appear far from helpful. Without a warning, he draws a tire iron from his belt, stomping aggressively towards her while addressing her by her name. As the armed assailant closes in for the kill, three massive gunshot wounds inexplicably manifest across his body and face. Suddenly, the cautionary rattling of a nearby snake draws her attention to the desert floor. Instead of concentrating on the disfigured lunatic cackling right in front of her, Katrina hucks a big rock at the coiled reptile, which only serves to piss it off even more. Having accomplished nothing, she turns away from the interspecies conflict to find both the dead man walking and his truck seem to have vanished into thin air. With that out of the way, Katrina heads back to town and pulls into a local motel to evaluate her situation. A quick Google search pulls up a slew of murders that have taken place in the town of Tulia in the recent history, one of which being the fatal shooting of a truck driver just outside the city limits. Clicking into the article reveals the victim to be the very same man that just threatened to bash her brains in on the side of the highway. Upon close examination of the crime scene photos, Katrina spots the faint silhouette of the healer woman standing off in the background. In a separate instance of senseless bloodshed, a lawyer that was stabbed to death in a local diner turns out to be the debt collector from back at the hospital. Evidently, the killer kept repeating a soul for a soul while carrying out the grisly act and just like before, the slender frame of the healer can be seen in the reflection of a window during the news coverage. Returning to the desert was a complete waste of our extremely limited time. If you trust your own eyes enough to believe what you saw back at the hospital, there's no point in burning up an hour round trip just to confirm what you already know. Unless we were certain we could sweet talk the old hag into letting this one slide, we should be spending every second we have concocting a foolproof plan to run someone out. There's no way we could have known ahead of time the truck driver was in on this, so we should have hightailed it the moment we saw him draw a weapon. Sure, we might might very well step on another rattlesnake, but a tire iron to the skull is going to kill you a hell of a lot faster than any snake venom. Of course, once we see that he's full of holes, it's a safe bet he's involved with the healer lady, especially since he seems to know about our situation. The good news is, between our run-in with the ghost trucker and what we saw online, we pretty much have all the proof we need to know that we aren't losing our shit. Unfortunately, none of it gets us any closer to resolving this situation, given the unusually high number of murders for such a small town, it's possible someone in the area has been looking into the situation, such as a journalist or member of the local law enforcement. We should do a search for any local articles attempting to link the events or that mention a mysterious healer, and then contact the author to try to find out what they know. That said, we're burning daylight, and if we can't find a way to weasel out of the deal, any time spent messing around with Scooby and the gang would only be working against us. Also, since we'll probably end up targeting somebody local, we should do our best to minimize 
minimize the amount of direct contact we have with the townsfolk. It's currently 12.18 p.m., and according to Google, sunset is at 5.37. Knowing now what must be done to save her daughter's life, Katrina changes into her best killing attire and heads back to the hospital in search of easy prey. She makes for the room directly across from Clara's, where she remembers seeing an unconscious old serial killer knocking at the pearly gates just a few hours before. Fortunately for her, the old man's still kicking. Well, sort of. Although that's likely to change in the very near future. With the man's son-in-law posted up by his side, Katrina goes for the long con and awkwardly attempts to befriend his grieving daughter, Lorraine, as she sits alone in the cafeteria. Introducing herself as Susan, she manages to invite herself back to the hospital room under the guise of needing some company while her daughter recovers. Eventually, Lorraine walks out to meet with her sister, lending Katrina a brief opportunity to handle business. She quickly shuts the door and pulls one of the pillows out from under her intended victim. But the thought of an entire family walking in on some rando snuffing out grandpa is more than she can bear, forcing her to abort at the last second and run into a nearby bathroom. After regaining her composure, Katrina exits the bathroom to a room full of people staring at her. But before she can explain what she was doing prowling around the toilet, an alarm on the nearby hospital equipment signals the old man's demise. Just like that, Katrina's first real opportunity to save her daughter's life goes to shit, and it won't be the last time either. Well, that sucks. The old man was by far our best ticket out of this nightmare. Unless there happens to be another short timer lying around here somewhere, things are about to get a hell of a lot more complicated. Katrina had the right target in mind, for sure, but her approach left a lot to be desired. First off, introducing yourself to the potential victim's daughter, even under an assumed name, is not a good idea. Yeah, it gets us closer to our mark, but it virtually guarantees she'll remember our face later on, especially if someone suspects foul play was involved in her father's death. Katrina also screwed up by giving up the real reason she was at the hospital, which could easily be used by investigators to figure out her true identity. A far better option would have been to post up in Clara's room and wait until the old man was alone. Only problem is, there'd be no way of knowing how much time we'd have before someone came back in to check on him, so whatever we do would have to be pretty quick. Now, before I delve into the specifics of ending this pre-criminal, let it be known that this seemingly nice old man truly onto his pillow is actually an escaped prison inmate convicted of murdering 22 people with a frying pan. If we don't act quickly, he'll use the cookware stash under his bed to carry out one last killing spree before he shuffles off for good. With that out of the way, smothering the heavily armed aggressor with a pillow would make it extremely difficult to determine a cause of death, and it's unlikely anyone would be asking too many questions if someone in his current state were to suddenly slip away. On average, this could take as long as three and a half minutes, and given his condition, it might not even take that long. But if we get the job done, only to get caught holding the smoking pillow, our daughter's gonna grow up believing her mom was a senicidal maniac. Speaking of his condition, dude's basically a single wet sneeze from dying. Once we're alone with him, I would just disconnect his oxygen supply and roll him out of bed onto the floor to seal the deal. This would be quick, relatively quiet, and his family would probably just assume he had one final burst of energy right before the end. Ultimately, analysis paralysis just cost Katrina big time. Let's hope going forward she'll be less likely to hesitate. Sometime later, Katrina sits sulking in her car when a creepy ass kid pedals up to the passenger side door. The expressionless youth knocks on the window before impatiently tapping at his wrist. He then begins slamming his forehead into the glass until it shatters. Terrified, Katrina falls backward out of the driver's side door and nearly takes an F-150 to the face. The irate motorist exits his vehicle and demands an explanation but Katrina barely acknowledges him, instead turning back to deal with the unattended child headbutting her Subaru, only he's gone. Wanting desperately to forget the last five minutes, Katrina heads straight to a local watering hole and knocks back a couple whiskeys. Just then, a frazzled young woman, Abby, walks in through the door wearing a busted lip. She quickly takes a seat at the bar, but before she can even drink her beer below the neck, her piece of shit husband Billy storms in and practically drags her off the stool. He then forces her to apologize to everyone there, to which the owner responds by telling them both to leave. Knowing that Billy's actually a mafia hitman sent to assassinate the owner of a local avocado farm, Katrina asks the bartender if they live nearby and follows them out to the street. She hops in her car and tails the couple all the way back to their house, taking note of their address before continuing down the roadways. After scoping the place out on Google Maps, she exits her vehicle
ankle and retrieves an embarrassingly small knife from a cooler in the back. Looking around to make sure no one's laughing, she sees a lone priest standing in the tagged up ruins of an ancient church. The helpful holy man politely reminds her that firearms are a thing before spontaneously bursting into flames and burning up without a sound. This divine inspiration brings her to a local gun shop, but because she's not a Texas resident, the owner is legally obligated to refuse the sale. Katrina begs him to bend the rules, claiming to be the victim of a recent highway attack that landed her daughter in the hospital. While this attempt clearly pulls at his heartstrings, the sympathetic old man reaffirms his inability to arm her himself, but he happens to know someone who can. The shopkeeper's directions lead Katrina to an old garage out in the boonies. At the owner's request, she shows her face to the nearby security camera, and the door opens, revealing a paint-splattered weirdo surrounded by his half-baked renditions of death metal album covers. Right off the bat, the strange man asks her for ID and pats her down. It's now 2.49 p.m., meaning Katrina has less than three hours to put someone in the dirt, or else it's curtains for her little girl. The money changes hands, and Katrina receives her Glock 19, but the price-gouging son of a bitch still wants another $40 for a box of nine. With their business concluded, the artsy arms dealer offers to teach her how to use the gun she just purchased, but Katrina's on a mission. She speeds off into the desert for a little trigger time. After watching a brief video by some Paul Harrell knockoff, Katrina takes a few cracks at a plastic water bottle, only managing to hit what she's aiming at from about 10 feet. Yeah, I get the kid on the bike was a real creeper, but at this point, Katrina should be used to seeing freaky shit that can't hurt her. Flipping out like that only draws unnecessary attention, which is the last thing we need while we're literally prowling around town looking for another evil psychopathic murderer to take out. Without our magical powers bestowed upon us, the citizens of Tulia would have no idea all these deceptively charming serial killers are lying in wait. It sort of figures that hanging around a bar in the middle of the day would be a great way to find an unsavory character, but damn. We hit the jackpot with this loser. The only downside is that he's not 100 years old and ready to keel over any second. But we'll have to take what we can get. Probably shouldn't have shown so much interest in him before leaving the bar, however. If he suddenly winds up dead, the bartender could remember that we were asking about him. I would have pretended to be freaked out by the experience and left without saying anything. We should also be careful not to tail him too closely. Folks in really small towns tend to recognize one another by the cars they drive, so seeing an unfamiliar vehicle following them home might arouse some suspicion. Once we know where Billy lives, we need to head back to the motel and change our clothes before we even think about making a move. Too many people have seen us in this outfit. If any one of his neighbors spot us going in and out of the house, there'll be more than a dozen people that could potentially recognize the description of what we're wearing. We'll also need to find something more substantial than Katrina's pathetic excuse for a knife. Fortunately, the Phantom Padre showed up in time to bring her the good word of Gaston Glock. Oddly enough, Katrina's in a ability to buy straight from the gun store may actually work to her advantage here. If Billy's found out to have been shot to death, the police may check with licensed dealers in the area to see if any recently purchased firearms were chambered in the same cartridge as the murder weapon. By scoring a piece off the books, there won't be any paperwork that could potentially point them in her direction. That said, federal law only prohibits the sale of handguns to non-residents, so she could have still purchased a rifle or shotgun without any issue. However, since we'll be forced to operate in broad daylight, we'd be much better off with a weapon we can easily conceal. Props to Katrina for passing that speech check. Her story had just the right mix of trauma and truth to make for an effective lie. Unfortunately, this led her to the creepiest person in all of Texas. I mean, look at this shit. Honestly, the moment I saw the security camera over the garage door, I would have noped right out of there and tried something else. Allowing yourself to be recorded outside an arms deal is exactly how you wind up on a true crime loser. Same with letting Papa Smurf memorize memorize your driver's license. Ace Hardware has plenty of perfectly deadly weapons we could buy without so much as a second glance from the cashier. A Gerber machete and a can of bear mace will go a long way, especially if they don't see it coming. Of course, no backsies is the second rule of arms dealing, so once we have the gun, there's no going back. Although that doesn't necessarily mean we have to use it. After all, in a town this small, there's no telling if Rembrandt here is actually Billy's uncle. Doesn't matter how discreet he is now. If he finds out we pop 
stopped someone close to him, he's for sure going to turn us in. For someone without any firearms experience, it couldn't hurt to pick up a few pointers from someone in the know. But the faster we can get away from this guy, the better. Besides, just because he's selling guns to strangers doesn't mean he knows the first thing about them. We'd probably be better off going back to the old man at the gun store to have him show us the ropes, and maybe snag a proper concealment holster while we're at it. There's only so much you can learn from GunTube anyways. Satisfied with her ability to shoot garbage at point-blank range, Katrina heads back into town to put her plan into action. Parking some distance away from the target's house, she hops a retaining wall into the backyard before tying a bandana around her face and creeping in through an unlocked door. Gun drawn, she carefully skulks through the house in search of her prey. From down the hall, she hears voices coming from the bathroom, along with the sound of running water. It turns out Billy and Abby are sharing a casual door-open shower. Suddenly, a bare-assed Billy steps out from behind the curtain to grab some dry towels from the laundry room, but instead of ear-holing the bastard right then and there, Katrina retreats into a nearby doorframe where she stands motionless in the open. Upon exiting the bathroom, Billy obliviously presents yet another painfully easy target, but once again, Katrina gets cold feet, opting instead to hide in the bedroom closet. From her hiding place, she overhears more abusive behavior, culminating in Billy's demand that Abby come receive her punishment for what happened back at the bar. For a moment, the terrified Abby picks up a pair of scissors, as if to do the job herself, but she quickly abandons her homicidal ideations and reluctantly joins her husband in the other room. Seizing the opportunity, Katrina exits the closet and moves towards the sound of a TV, pausing along the way to grab a set of car keys off the dresser. Once in the kitchen, she has a clear line of sight on Billy as he stares blankly at the cage fight flickering on the screen, but decides to move in even closer before risking a shot. Rounding the corner into the living room, she finds Abby being forced to stand still while holding out encyclopedias in some kind of messed up throwback punishment ritual. The startled woman drops the books to the floor, drawing outrage from her psychotic spouse, but Katrina steps in before things escalate further. Holding the man at gunpoint, she orders Abby onto the floor and tosses the car keys in Billy's lap, meekly demanding he lead her out to the garage. Once there, she forces him into the driver's seat of his Tacoma and climbs into the seat behind him. Katrina instructs her hostage to drive them out to Palo Duro Canyon, using her phone for turn-by-turn -turn navigation while laying down in the back seat. It's like she wants to get caught. First off, why wait until you're already trespassing to cover your face? In the age of ring doorbells and affordable home security systems, you should assume you're on camera pretty much any time you go outside. I would have been in full ninja mode well before I even got anywhere near the place. Yeah, it's gonna look suspicious, but you know what else looks suspicious? Your face going in and out of a murder scene. I would also have selected some kind of mask that covered my head completely. Katrina's hair sticking out from under the hat only provides witness with yet another identifiable characteristic. Also, why is she not wearing gloves? There's literally no reason we couldn't have picked up a cheap pair on our way back to Billy's house. Even wearing some basic blue nitrile gloves payday style would be enough to keep our fingerprints from showing up all over the place. All of this is beside the fact that Katrina's whole plan is a complete and utter shit show. We have no way of knowing where Billy and Abby are in the house, whether they're the only ones living there, or whether they could have dogs that would alert them to our presence. Also, given this is rural Texas, there's pretty much a 100% chance of them being armed. And just because Billy's got it coming doesn't mean he won't be cleared of all charges for planting an armed intruder on site. Given what we know about our target's violent tendencies, a much better option would be to draw him outside and verbally antagonize him until he attacks us. If we kill him in self-defense, getting spotted by the neighbors won't really make much of a difference. We could just ring the doorbell and demand that he apologize for being such a jerk back at the bar. According to the bartender, Billy has a well-known reputation for being an abuser, so hearing he attacked someone in a fit of rage probably wouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Although, it might be a good idea to plant a gas station pocket knife on him just in case. But since Katrina just had to go doing things the hard way, our number one priority should be getting in and out as quickly as possible. We just need to run in, turn his head into a canoe, and split, preferably without Abby or anyone else seeing us in the process. Considering we were able to get a clear line of sight on him four different times without him noticing, this actually could have been super easy, but clearly mag dumping into trash was not enough to mentally prepare ourselves for showtime. Once Abby sees us, there is absolutely no reason for us to deviate from our simple plan of shoot and scoot, only now we'll probably have to waste her too, especially since she's actually a sleeper agent for the D.
DPRK, plotting to fatally sabotage an airliner on its way to the next Olympic Games. Just because her husband is a colossal piece of garbage doesn't mean she'll lie to cover up what really happened. Yeah, it's a messed up thing to do to someone who's already suffering a great deal. But that's what happens when you hesitate, Katrina. Be better. Forcing Billy to drive us out to the middle of nowhere when we've already been spotted holding him at gunpoint makes zero sense. Do you honestly think she's not going to make the connection between us leaving together and him being found dead? We're just creating an opportunity for him to turn the tables on us. I mean, for all we know, he keeps a P320 in the glove box for just such an occasion. But if that's the route we just have to go down, then we should at least keep an eye on his driving to make sure he's not deliberately trying to get us pulled over. And also, wear your seatbelt. I mean, this isn't a safety thing, but all he'd have to do is jerk the wheel into oncoming traffic, we'd be eating dashboard, and our plan, along with our daughter, go up in flames. At least poor Clara wouldn't be around to see that mess. Upon arriving at their destination, she tells him to kill the engine and hand over the keys. Billy complies, but when asked to exit the vehicle, he flat refuses, knowing exactly what's waiting for him the second his foot touches the sand. She leans in close to scream the point across, giving Billy an opportunity to knock the gun away before launching into a full-on strangling. Unable to reach her pistol, she brains him with a nearby travel mug and frees herself from the front seat sandwich. But by the time she's retrieved her weapon, Billy's already got a head start into the canyon. Katrina takes off after him, her Glock blazing with all the accuracy of an average Bond villain. But she quickly loses him in the many twists and turns of the earth and maze. As the sun begins to set, Katrina runs across the apparition of a missing Australian hiker she saw during her research. It's now 5.39 p.m. The saucy Aussie Ghibli tells her that she's shit out of luck. Now the only chance she has to save her daughter's life at this point is by sacrificing her own. Residing herself to this conclusion, Katrina begins recording a final farewell to her daughter. But before she can get to the whole unaliving herself part of the equation, Billy appears out of nowhere and tags her in the head with a rock. Moments later, Katrina awakens to find herself staring down the barrel of her own Glock. Realizing time is running out, she pulls a little green knife from her sock and jams the blade into her throat. Shocked by what he's seeing, Billy neglects to spot the rattlesnake coiled up by his foot. Like young Clara before him, the snake lashes out and nails him in the leg, sending him tumbling over backward off a short cliff. Having yet to pierce anything vital, Katrina pulls the plug on her attempt at self-deletion and goes to check on Billy's condition. His arms and legs are completely screwed, but he still seems to be breathing, at least for now. With the sun ducking behind the canyon walls, Katrina clenches the knife in her teeth, pirate style, and descends the sheer cliff towards the broken man below. Upon reaching her target, she spares a moment to reassure her mark before plunging the small blade into his throat and wrenching it ear to ear. With her end of the bargain fulfilled, Katrina exits the canyon to find the healer watching from on high, along with all the ghosts of the killing's past. She then proceeds to firebomb Billy's Tacoma and runs off into the night towards the distant lights of Tulia, Texas. Finally, back in her own vehicle, Katrina receives a phone call from the hospital. According to the doctor, Claire has made a full recovery and is now ready to be picked up. After collecting her little girl, the two stay the night at the local motel and get back on the road the next morning. On their way out of town, Clara spots a hitchhiker up ahead. As they pass him by, Katrina makes eye contact with the man. It's Billy. The movie ends. Okay, I mean, he might be a human disease, but credit where it's due. Billy staged an excellent counterattack. Katrina's just lucky he didn't clean out his pickup. More things would have ended a lot differently. Of course, this easily could have been avoided had she remembered her gun was, in fact, a gun, and kept it out of his reach. We should have been sitting on the passenger side to create as much distance as possible for just this reason. Instead of running and shooting like someone who wants their daughter to die alone in the hospital, we should have taken a more stable shooting stance and aimed for the center of Billy's back as he was running away. Popping off shots we can never hope to land is a huge waste of our limited ammunition. Now would also be a good time to slap in another one of the three 15 round magazines that Glock 19 comes with, unless of course that stingy weirdo screwed us on those too. Once we lose sight of Billy, following him into the canyon is a huge risk. He could easily post up around a corner somewhere and try to stage an ambush, or even climb up on one of the walls to double back towards town. Our best bet would be to find an elevated position and keep an eye out while listening for any movement. The closer it gets to sundown, the more aggressive we'll have to be in our search efforts, which is why we shouldn't be wasting our time chatting up Casper. Besides, running our mouth like this will almost certainly give away our position. Ultimately, had Billy decided to simply cut his losses and run away, we would have had no other choice but to make the ultimate sacrifice to save her daughter's life. That said, he still had plenty of time to unload on us before getting bitten by the snake, so it really was just dumb luck that Katrina was able to make it out alive. After all this, she sure 
sure took her sweet ass time dishing out the coup de gras. We're on the clock here. Just slot his head and get it over with. Now that it's dark out and we're nearly 40 miles out of town, we probably shouldn't destroy our only means of transportation. Furthermore, if this was always the plan, we should have just blown Billy's brains out while he was sitting in the driver's seat. Instead, we're left to run a marathon and a half with a traumatic brain injury. Not to mention the fact that we're completely covered in blood, which means anyone that sees us walking back to our car is absolutely going to remember it, especially when the word gets out about a body being found nearby. Once we pick up Clara, we need to get the hell out of Dodge before we wind up in a jail cell. There's no way Abby didn't tell someone about the nervous woman in a bright yellow hoodie that kidnapped her husband at gunpoint, and news like that tends to travel pretty fast in a small town. We'll probably also have to cancel that trip to visit her mom's place, as we're going to have to start a new life somewhere a hell of a lot further away than Oklahoma. At the very least, I'd be sure to avoid Tulia, Texas for the rest of my life. In the end, Katrina successfully fulfilled her end of the bargain and saved Clara's soul, but her failure to commit on several occasions almost cost her her daughter's life, and in some cases even her own. Had she acted decisively back at the hospital, or better yet, when she had Billy dead to rights in his own house, she could have avoided the deadly game of hide-and-seek that landed her on the wrong end of her own gun. When it's all said and done, I think the blood contract for Rattlesnake was beaten. How would you have beaten Rattlesnake? Let me know in the comments. Hit the like button to get Katrina some target practice. And don't forget to subscribe for more random acts of violence. Thanks for watching, and remember, no step on Snick. And don't forget to check out Dragon City by clicking the link in the description or scanning my QR code.